You are now listening to the A Dose of Disruption podcast, powered by Experian. Weekly compelling conversations on making money moves and growing your network. The place where you can learn to be you and do you all at the same time. I'm your host, Shelly Bell. And now, let's see what this week's Level Up looks like. All right, you know what time it is. It is time for your Shelly Brief, Shelly Brief, Shelly Brief. All right, so um, this is going to be just like a revelation that I had the other day <laughs> while I was waiting for my baggage. Seeing your bag on the baggage claim belt is like seeing your kid like in a crowd and you're just like waiting. You're like, ooh, can't wait till they get over to me. Can't wait till they get over to me. And you're like, you know, you're going to have to pick it up because it's heavy as hell. And you know, you're going to, and you're, you, <laughs> you know, you got to get it. But you're also like, yes, my bags are here. Um, and I think that one, I'll say it's a different take on bags, right? So like, okay, y'all rock with me because y'all know I'll be having crazy thoughts. And like, so I'm just so glad y'all here for me to share all of my crazy thoughts with. Thank you. So, um, baggage, things you're carrying, things you're lugging, like the way that it's talked about in media, the way that it's, the way that it's talked about in, um, and just like, you know, just like the way people talk about it socially is like, Ooh, she got baggage. Ooh, she got baggage. Ooh, he got baggage. Ooh, look at that baggage. Hey, hey, look at that baggage. Hey, <laughs> in fact, that's how it should be viewed because you know what? We don't think about baggage like that any other ways that we're being right. Like you, you go, you have to pack a bag to go. You have to pack a bag to leave. So when you're thinking about your baggage and you're thinking about how it may have been communicated to you as something that is like inappropriate, wrong, not great. Like you're carrying too much. It's not about the fact that you're carrying something at all. Like there's, there's not a place where you're carrying nothing. But when you're ready to move on to the next layer of your life, you pack a bag, right? When you're the same way when you ready, when you're moving into another place or you move, but you pack it up and then you unpack it, right? So what you want to make sure is that on your trip to your next place in life, that you have decided to pack the most essential things, the things that make you happy. And that you, they are going to unpack when you get to that other level too. So, so if you have packed things that have been weighing you down, guess what? You can package them up to get to that other level. But when you get there, guess what's going to happen? It's going to unpack itself. You going to unpack yourself. You're, it's going to, it, eventually the package is going to unpack. And then you're going to be looking like, well, dang, I, I know I progress. How did I like, why is this thing still on this level? And that's because you packed it in the bag and took it with you. Now it ain't about you carrying too much baggage. You're too heavy. You're doing too much. You ain't enough. You did like, it ain't about none of that. And we got to let go of those narratives because those narratives seep into other ways of being, um, and other ways of doing things, which is like, am I carrying too much? I don't want no baggage. I don't want no person with no baggage. I don't want no man with no baggage. I don't want no friends with no baggage. I don't want no woman with no baggage. That's complete bullshit. Okay, we all got bags. If you, a matter of fact, if you going anywhere or if you've been anywhere, guess what? You have bags. Now, what you have in those bags, you had to package them up. You had to package it up, take it with you, drag, and it's there for different reasons. So, like this, just I love to kind of pierce the uh, sayings and phrases and narratives that people have given to us that we've owned. Right. So you're like, oh, yeah, I am kind of um, sad. I do get depressed a lot. That is my baggage. Oh, yeah, I do got three kids. You know, that is my baggage. Right. Like that's not that while it is something that comes with you when you see that, when you see that baggage like that, <laughs> like that kid coming out of the building, you picking him up. you like, oh, I can't wait to get to it because I'm so glad it is here. I needed it. I don't want to wait any longer for it. Um, and I know I'm going to have to pick it up. And I know I'm have to carry it, and I'm okay with that. And and I'm okay with the people who engage with me, because I, I if I have a person with me who's like rocking with me as a support person, then yeah, I expect their hand to come out to, to pick that baggage up when they see my baggage. And that's the kind of friends you want to like to pick to reach their hand out to be like, mm, girl, let me get that. 
uh, honey, let me get that for you. And it's not a, it's not a chore for them. Right. So I just empower, encourage you to look at your bags different, to look at what you're carrying different, to, to fill out the weight of it different, to think about like what other ways and perspective could I add to what I'm carrying, to what I'm doing, to who I'm being? Cause being is one of the most important parts of existing. Well, I guess existing and being are the same thing, but you get what I'm saying, right? Like who you are being, who you want to be, what is in your being, what you're carrying in your being, who you're being with other people, who other people are being with you, um, is a little different from how you're acting. If you are um, carrying things that you that you have perceived as heavy baggage, then you are acting. You could some be acting, you know, like they're he- heavy as well. When in reality, that's not your narrative. That's somebody else that don't want to date somebody with with kids. That's on them. They ain't got nothing to do with you. That's somebody else that wants you to be smaller. That ain't they ain't got nothing to do with you. Um, you know, somebody else that wants you to be somewhere, do something, act some way. That has nothing to do with you. So I empower and encourage everyone to to think about how are you being? How are you being with the bags you're packing and unpacking? And bags will pack and unpack over time. I know some of y'all out there have had luggage that you've had for years. Literally, it's busting at the seams. <laughs> but guess what? You unpack it same way you pack it. Either and you keep it moving. And you can do that with things you're carrying in life as well. And today's guest couldn't be a you know couldn't be a better example of that. Because she is someone who writes it out, you know, sets out to take over and conquer, and then does that thing. Her name is Jewel Burt Solomon. She is a general partner at Collab Capital, which just raised a $50 million fund. Um, a group of black folks, good, great hearted black folks with the great and right intentions of mind who have, have been a part of like all different styles of being a founder. They, are they raised a fifty million dollar fund, which is amazing. I love it. Um, she's also the the head of Google for startups. Um, and so she like her story is amazing. We're gonna talk about it. We're gonna get into it. So without further ado, let's go. Let's get into it. Welcome to the show, Jewel Burks. I'm so excited. Um, wanted to just catch up with you because you're someone that I admire and really appreciate. Um, and you have, you have a whole lot of journey going on, right? So like, I am interested. So wait, first, which, which title do you lead with? Because now you're like general partner at Collab Capital. You are also the head of, uh, some few really important things over at Google. Also just badass, kick-ass founder. Like, what do you prefer? I wear all the hats, <laughs> so both and or all of it. <laughs> um, so our first question is always, you could be doing anything right now. You could be a professional moonwalker. You could be um, biking the Tour de France at some point. Maybe not now, let's go. But you could be doing Anything in the world, mountain climbing, lion taming, any of that, why did you choose to be a general partner at Collab Capital? Well, I chose to start Collab because I experienced what it was like as a founder to have difficulty raising money. And I also knew that there were hundreds, if not thousands of other founders like me um, who had great ideas, who had built outstanding technology, who had built up amazing teams and weren't getting the capital that they needed to really elevate their their ideas and, and their companies. And so I made a vow to myself when I was building my company Part Pick um, years ago that if I ever made it on the other side of that, that I would really become the investor that I wish I had. And so when I sold my company in 2016, um, I first started angel investing. And then I quickly realized that I was seeing more great deals than I had the capacity to invest in on my own. 
So I started talking to um, Barry Givens and Justin Dawkins, and they were in a similar situation where they were kind of coming out of businesses that they started and were looking at how do they make sure that the next generation of founders coming up doesn't have the same struggles that uh, that we had. And so we got together and started talking about, you know, how do we build something that really is a new institution specifically focused on Black founders. And so that was the genesis behind Collab Capital. And a few years later, now here we are with the fund, first fund raised, and now we are actively investing in um, Black-led innovation companies. So you're so humble and so kind because it's not just any fund. It's $50 million, completely Black-owned, like <laughs> Black-led fund, right? Which is a unicorn in the industry that we're in, right? Like in that way. And then not only that, like even just like, oh, when I launched my company, Part Pick, and then we did, and I sold it. No, 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 no. Like we, we're not gonna just brush over that. Like it was just like, oh, and then I just kind of sold the thing, and I do. Like this is amazing, and I know even just like being on a journey. How do you like really absorb it all, and like, and really go like, I did a thing, or like you know, like you know what that. That, that one time, that was that was a major. Like, how do you do that? I think that you know, how do you celebrate, or do you have your moments of? People ask me that, and that's why I'm asking you because it's a hard question for me. <laughs> so yeah, how do you how do you take it all in, like your accomplishments, and celebrate them? Yeah, I mean that is hard for me. I'm really never satisfied. I always feel like there's a lot more that I can be doing. Um, but I will say I am proud of myself and my accomplishments and um, I feel good about what I've been able to to do. So I do try to take moments to pat myself on the back and, you know, feel good about the ways in which I've been able to get things accomplished. And, you know, everything that I've done, I really have had a vision about it beforehand. So with selling my company I really knew that that was going to happen. So I think that's probably another reason why it's hard for me to get super excited because it's like, well, this is what I plan to do. And then I did it. And so <laughs> it is what it is. Same thing with Collab. You know, we put out the the goal when we made that goal to, to raise a $50 million fund. That was the goal. So getting it done, of course, is, is a great accomplishment, but it's kind of like, this is what we said we're going to do. So I think that kind of keeps me grounded in everything is just realizing that when you say what you're going to do, you put the work in to do it and then you get it done. Um, of course, it's a good feeling, but it's it's not a lot of room for celebration because it's kind of like this is what I said I was going to do. So now I got to now I have to do the next step. So with raising the fund, that's the first step is, is getting the money into the fund. Now I have to go invest it and then help the companies grow and scale so that I can create uh, uh, returns um, out of the fund. So it's like, this is just step number one. I can't get too high on on that part. Now I got to go and do the rest. So, um, so yes, yeah, always more to do, always more to accomplish. So I try to keep things pretty level as far as the excitement around everything. No, I appreciate that because what I'm hearing you say is that like, it's one thing to set a goal, but it's another thing to make a decision that this is what I'm going to do, right? Yeah. I feel like a lot of times... Um, over the course of just your journey, like growing up, like people tell you all the time, set goals, have a mentor, but nobody gives you any like advice past that. You just know you need to set goals, find somebody to admire or look at, and then that's just all you got, right? And that's how you become successful. So I love the idea of like, yes, set the goal, but then this is what I'm going to do. Um, and I'm, of course, there's moments in there. So well, I think that's interesting. So when you built Part Pick, you were thinking that you wanted to sell it? Yeah, um, I knew that it was so niche what we were doing that I wasn't going to be the type of founder that went and had an IPO. You know, I didn't envision myself like ringing the bell on the New York Stock Exchange. I really saw it as something that would be a great value add to a larger company. So I always had that perspective when I was building it. And from the start, I kind of wrote a list of the potential acquirers and I 
try to situate myself so that I would be valuable to them one day. Now, I didn't expect to sell the company when I did. It definitely happened earlier than I expected. But I will say that when it, the offer came, I had to remind myself, oh, you, you did put this out there. That <laughs> this is something that you want. So that actually helped me make my decision because I realized like, you know, you you kind of spoke this into existence. And so you can't be surprised that it's happening because you, you said it was going to happen. So um, the timing of it, like I said, was a little bit different than what I expected. But I think, you know, it all worked out how it was supposed to. And was Amazon on your list of people? Because you didn't just sell to a quiet company in the background. Like you sold to Amazon, like Amazon acquired. Were they on your list of people that could potentially acquire? They were, they were the number one company on the list. I love that. You know what? <laughs> okay, so I talk about this a lot because I'm super woo-woo, okay? So I'm all about all the intuitive things, and I have an intuition coach, and she does a lot of coaching around intuitive entrepreneurship. Um, and Ashley, I heard many people talk about intuition and entrepreneurship publicly um, until I had an interv- I interviewed uh, Susie Batiste, who's the founder of, uh, of Poopery. Mm-hmm. And she talked about being just being like, it's intuition. Like she she was like, I, I can't even give you that it's this strong like business acumen. She's like, I'm telling you, I had a gut feeling. I went, you know, I learned what I needed to learn to make it work, made it work, and then I continue on that path. Would you say that like intuition? I'm hearing you say like the manifesting, the like saying it out loud. Like, would you say that intuition is a, a large part of your journey? And are there ways that you activate it intentionally? I hear you saying, write things down, saying things out loud. Do you sticky note? Do you whiteboard? Do you like, what's your process like? Yeah, I'm such a big believer in intuition and gut and faith in entrepreneurship. Um, everything, I, I'm like starting to write a book and I'm going back and reading like old notebooks that I had and emails that I wrote to myself and like emails that I wrote to my mom. And there's so much in it that's me forecasting like what's going to happen or me saying this is what I believe, this is what I think. Um, And I was a lot of times I was right. (laughs) So, um, yeah, I think that's so important. And I feel like being very in tune with what you your gut, like what you feel is really important for founders um, because there's so much distraction. There are so many things to kind of take you off of what's inside and what kind of what your core is telling you. And I can give many testimonies of any time that I went against what, what I felt, that was the wrong decision. Every time I went with what I felt, that was the right decision. So I feel like, you know, that's always, I've been, very fortunate to trust myself and really listen to myself and try to give myself quiet time so that I can be in tune with what with what's going on inside um, and use that as guidance and then try to align myself with people who are similarly in tune with what's going on with them. Um, you know, I think I, I really value the partnership I have with Barry and Justin because we can have those types of conversations um, and, and guide the work that we do by the the center part of ourselves and the spirit part of ourselves. And so um, I like what you said about being woo woo. I think I'm a little bit of that, too. <laughs> um, but I, I think I've seen the results of it. I really can go back and think of many examples of when. I trusted my gut. I went with my gut and that was the right thing. And then several examples of when I let my head lead and that was the wrong thing. So, yeah. Yeah, no, it works every time. It just makes it hard to answer in interviews. So when people are like, well, why did you do? And I'm like, I don't know. I just, I woke up and I was like, you know what? We're going to do this thing, you know, like, and then it's like, I wish I had a better process for you. I think people are sometimes searching for the formula for how they do it for themselves. Themselves. I'm so glad to hear you writing a book. It's gonna be amazing. I can't wait to read it. <laughs> um, and I think like people are always searching for what is the formula. What do I adapt? And I'm like, create your own formula. Like, you got to figure out what you adapt on your own, right? Yeah, um, that's, now, that's huge. Seen... No, no, go ahead. 
No, I was going to say that that piece is so big. Like that's actually part of what I'm writing is that people get so locked into what somebody else did and what was their process. And, and all of that is good and it can be informative. But the reality is your experiences, you know, what you had exposure to in your life, what you feel, what you've seen, all of that plays into what your path looks like. And so you could I can tell you every single thing I did. And you can try to do the exact same thing. And it's not going to turn out the same because it's it's different. You're different. Um, so I think that's it's just an important point. Yeah, I'm, um, I'm working on a book, too. And one of the chapters is like authenticity as a hack, because it's like really people don't expect you to just sometimes be yourself. Yeah. Um, and so but it's like that's all you got. <laughs> so figure out your own thing. So I think you've seen all the different parts of what this business of founding, funding, investing, selling, like you've now seen 360 degrees of what it means to be on this business journey. There is a a, a knowledge gap in between being a founder and being an investor. Um, there's an, even, even going into an accelerator, um, and what people think they're going to ex- experience or not experience. What are some of those like key learnings along that like distance between like founder and investor? Cause I think like funder, I want to be, I want to be intentional about my words around like there's, there's funder, but then there's investor. Yeah. <laughs> right. Which is, which is, I'm responsible for some other people's money that I got to make good on the return for. Therefore, while I love you and I think you're amazing, <laughs> we got the collaboration of how we make this look right. We got to make sure it's all, all the way together. So what are some of those key learnings along your journey of like from founder to acquisition to, um, to launching it, the accelerator with the Google to also now like having your own investment fund. Yeah. So you're right. I have literally seen all sides of <laughs> all sides of it. And that's been intentional. I wanted to understand every aspect of tech entrepreneurship, investing so that I can be helpful to people that are coming up um, in this world. But I would say the biggest learning um, and thing that I I really like for founders to get an understanding of is something that you kind of hit on, which is the mindset of the investor. Um, So if you're a founder that's looking for funding, I think it's very important that you understand the person that you're talking to on the other side of the table and what their motivations are, what they're looking for, what's driving them. Because if you understand that and you understand, for example, something like, If I have a $50 million fund, when I make an investment, I am assessing the company from the standpoint of, do I believe that my investment in this company has the potential to make me $50 million? That's basically the question that I'm asking anytime I talk to a company. And any fund you talk to, if you talk to a billion dollar fund, they're looking to see is my investment in this company going to make me a billion dollars? Basically, every investor is wanting to know if this is could be a fund returner. That's kind of the, the statement or the, the idea. And so if you realize that, then you could kind of guide the conversation or not have conversations with certain people if you know that you're not building a business that, that's going to be you know a, a $20, million, $20 billion business, then you, you don't need to be having a conversation with certain investors. So all of that, I think I didn't really have an appreciation for when I was first starting fundraising. And I was taking it real personal when people were like, oh, no, this isn't a fit for what we're doing. I'm like, what? How is that a fit? But then <laughs> but then when I started to understand more about what are the drivers for investors, then I could take some of the emotion out of it and then really focus my attention in my conversation with investors where there would be more alignment and a better fit. So I think that's something that founders don't don't typically have an appreciation for. And I think it will save them a lot of time if they had a better sense of what is it that's driving the person on the other side of the table? What metrics are they looking for? What do they have to 
you know, take back to their limited partners and their fund? Or are they an angel investor where they are managing their own money and they don't have to, you know, they don't have to go back to anybody else? So that's something that I would I would think about for founders that are looking to raise money. And then one other thing I'll say is there's an overemphasis on fundraising and a um, not as much of a needed emphasis on building businesses. So that's something that I've always. Okay. <laughs> Hello. Can we do it? I, I don't have my air horns with me, but like, I'm like, listen, the best kind of funding is a customer. Right. Exactly. And so people really don't understand that piece, which is 90, 99% of businesses never receive venture funding. Only 1% of businesses receive venture funding, yet so many founders think that that's what they have to do. But the reality is that's the best, like you said, the best funding is is from customers. So if you can build a business that has customers and generates revenue, you can reinvest that revenue. That's a kind of preferable path. So those types of things I think are are really important for founders to, to think about on the front end. No, no, I think that's right. I mean, well, I'm working on it over here, okay? Like, I'm telling them every chance I get, like, y'all do not understand. But I think one of the things that has become really sexy, I'll say, is the, like, celebrity VC thing, where it's, like, the person who's so out front that the people who are pitching to them can't see that there's a rack of people (laughs) <laughs> behind them with the promise with the money, right? Saying like, okay, like I need you to return capital for me too. Like it's not only returning capital for the person out front, like, you know, collab capital and jewel berry and just are are doing the work for them for a lot of people. Yeah. I think one of the things that was eye opening for me is um like understanding pension funds. And institutional capital, and and then bringing it back into like imagine that you work for a school system, right? And your retirement, your pension, is in this place making capital, right? Like in this investment portfolio. Well, the person in that portfolio running that portfolio, the fund itself, then invest in other funds with the hopes of getting returns for you. Mm-hmm. Right. And like, so when you meet that VC, if they they have institutional capital in their in their fund, that's another level of looking at the founder. And so founders always get offended with the like, you're too early or you're not a good fit. But it's not because you're not great or because your business is not great or because you can't make it at some point. But it is literally because you may have to as a founder determine the actions that you want to take that would be best for an investor. So to your point of like selling, what have you seen or like what advice do you talk to founders around selling? Like a lot of um, black founders don't want to sell. I do think some may have dreams of IPO, but I think um, I sometimes wonder if people even, like see themselves on that route or are they just looking at, I'm just running a good business, get some money for some folks and keep running it forever. You know, you are someone who has sold a company What like you, but you knew you were going to do it from the beginning. So I think like for a person who's like, I'm not going to, I just want to run this company and get it right. What do you say to those people? Yeah. So I really encourage founders to do a visioning exercise and going back to the woo stuff, but Thinking, I I tell people, think about yourself in 10 years. Where do you see yourself? Do you see yourself on a beach? Do you see yourself in an office? Do you see yourself with people around you? Do you see yourself still running the day-to-day of your business? Or have you hired somebody else to do it for you? Like really taking time to think about your life in 10 years and how you see it. Do you see yourself? You know, when I was building Park Pick, I saw myself married you know when i did this exercise i saw myself married with a family and not in the day-to-day of my business so that's what helped me realize okay i'm gonna have to sell this business at some point if that's how i see my life um some people will say i see myself running this business 
for as long as I can. And so selling is not in the cards for them because they really want to be at the helm forever. So that exercise of like, literally, what do you think your life will look like in 10 years? Or what do you want it to look like? And then working yourself back from there and making decisions along the way that will help you get to whatever that destination is that you're trying to get to. That to me is like the best thing that founders can do from the beginning, because you will make different decisions about the course of the company. If you see yourself, if you, if the vision that comes to you in 10 years is you ringing the the bell on the New York Stock Exchange or NASDAQ, then you're going to, you're probably going to raise money for your company to get it to that scale point where you can take it public. If you see yourself, you know, being a neighborhood business and everybody in the neighborhood knowing you and you running the day to day and all of that, then you're probably not going to raise money for the business because that's not a scaling type of business. So anyway, I think visioning that exercise of really setting out what is it that you see for yourself, your life, the people around you, and then working yourself back from that to make decisions in the business, to me, is like the best thing you can do um, at the early stage of your company so that you're actually doing the things that are going to get you to where you're trying to go. Yeah, I love that because a lot of times um, that's a mismatch for people. Right. So, and that's why they're raising funding from the wrong folks or trying to go after funding from the wrong investors because that keeping it 100 with yourself is a skill set. Yes. <laughs> like, like being honest with yourself is a skill set. Like, you got to get to the point where you're just completely honest with yourself about those realities that you want to create. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so, Tell us about your work you're doing at Google because I didn't even I want to really I want to visit that and it's just like you after selling your company did you want to um, go back into like full time work or did you want to <laughs> so, so how did the like how like what happened what happens in between the like I sold my company and then and then moving to Google. Yeah, well, so this well, is back to our, Google, you already at Google, right? Yeah, I've been. This is my third time at Google, um, but this is the part of the visioning exercise where I stopped it short. I didn't finish it because <laughs> I didn't know what was going to happen after I sold the business, and so this is why I tell people now you have to play the whole thing, the whole scenario out, because I definitely like I had the perspective around selling the business. I did not know enough to know what happens post acquisition. And so in my deal, the part of the deal was for me to stay on at Amazon and I, I had a, I had money tied in into me staying on. So, um, so I, I really wanted to get all the money that I was owed. So I stayed for three years. Now that was not ideal because I didn't, I didn't enjoy like the team that I was working on. Um, I, of course, was happy about the work that I was doing because the work that I was doing was um, trying to get our product out to the masses via the Amazon uh, mobile app. And so that was rewarding work. And that was kind of like what I wanted to do. But I should have asked more questions, particular questions about the team that I would be working with and the resourcing that we would have and kind of all of these things that I really didn't think about. So that's advice for anyone who is thinking about selling the company is that you have to you have to go a step further from the day that you sign your, you know, the sign for the sale and what happens next. If you are going to stay on or if you do have some type of earnout or something that's tying you up to stay with the business, you want to ask a lot of questions about who you're going to be reporting to, what kind of support you're going to have, what kind of resources you're going to have, what is your team structure going to look like, all of those types of things. Um but as far as, so so for me, I stayed at Amazon for three years and then I I saw for myself a break. <laughs> I was planning on taking a break, but I actually got recruited back to Google to lead Google for Startups. And my decision, the reason that I, I took the position or, you know, went after the position was because I knew that a break for me was not going to be really a break. I was still going to be working with startups and, you know, working right. on, on uh, raising collab. And so I thought, well, 
why not take this opportunity and, and really this amazing platform to be able to work with startups and have the resources of Google behind me. And so I've been really intentional in that role, um, focused on moving resources from Google to startups that really need it. And so things like, you know, last year we did the Black Founders Fund, where we were able to fund 76 Black-led companies across the U.S. Um, we've done Founders Academy. We've run a lot of different programs uh, to really focus on Black, Latinx, and veteran-founded companies. And so that's, for me, that's like hard work. It's, it's literally what I would be doing anyway. Um, so it's good to just have the support of Google behind that work. Yeah, Jason Scott, um, I love him. Just amazing human being. Yeah. One, this is why I love the collab team as well. Like, I people are like, oh, they got a great fun. I'm like, they have a great fun and they're great human beings. Like, there, there's like just something to just being like super good people that like I'm all about. Um, but Jason is one of those folks um, at Google. And actually, Jason has been a large part of Black Girl Ventures journey and us scaling across the country um, because through his team, he was with um, Google Cloud for startups. He actually is the one who was our partner to get when we went to different offices. So he's been a huge part of the Black Girl Ventures journey. I love him. So yeah, much. actually, um, I met Jason at a Black Girl Ventures. Oh, that's right. Yeah, that was my first time meeting him. And now we're like super, I think maybe... I wasn't back at Google at that time because that might, that might have been 2019. Mm -hmm. I don't think you, I don't think so. Yeah, so so I'm, that's the first time I, I think we met. Maybe we had known each other, but I, I, that's my first time meeting him in person for sure. Um, and now, like he, we're close colleagues. So he and he's awesome. Yeah, that's crazy. That's right. I forgot about that. Yeah, we were both judges. So okay, I have a question there. I don't know. You know, you're probably off the asked this by family and friends and. And, and colleagues. But my question is, you've seen a lot of success. You're rocking and rolling. I agree with you. I'm 100% I'm with you on just how sometimes insatiable I think um, it can get or I could be around like, what's next? Like, or like never satisfied. It's like, I got to go. <laughs> like, okay, that was cool. Y'all celebrate that. I'm over here because I got to go find these founders, get them to win, figure it, like all these things. But what do you need? The blessing of my life is that I have everything I need. I have love for my family and friends. Um, I'm doing exactly what I want to be doing, which is so freeing and liberating to be in a space where professionally I'm literally living my dream. And I'm, I'm healthy. I am have shelter. Like, I literally have everything I need. I, I really can't think of anything. Um, this is a funny question because my birthday is coming up and every year my husband is like, what do you want for your birthday? And I'm like, I'm good. I got everything I, I want. And it's, it really aggravates him a lot. But I mean, more time, I guess, would be always great. I would love to have more time to like just chill and, and read and write. That's probably what I what I need. I need more time. Uh, that's That would be my answer. <laughs> that's the only thing that I feel like I'm I'm lacking. Yeah, no, I get it. Okay. Yeah, I think, you know, it, it it's it's awesome. Congratulations to you for like living out your dream and like really rocking and rolling. If founders are out there and they like, I would love to be invested in by Collab Capital. Well, one thing we know, can you return fifty fifty million dollars? <laughs> like first thing that way. Um, what other things should they be thinking about or um, or it, or are and are there places that they should be networking through, right? Because I think that like sometimes it's not always like okay, person launch is fun, go straight to them. Like I don't know if that's always the best path, and we don't often get to give people the advice around what should your path be. Because of course it's so individual, but it's like maybe consider these things before you think about approaching a collab or any fun. What, what does that look like? Yeah, I mean, the first thing is like build something that's super simple, but people skip steps and they go straight to, I need to raise money 
And that's not the first step. The first step is you need to validate that whatever problem it is you're working on is a, is a big enough problem that people are going to pay you to solve it for them. And then once you have some security in that idea, then you should build something. Honestly, the barrier to building is has lowered significantly since I was building for sure. Um, you can you can spin up an MVP like very quickly and with little money at this point. Um, and so I really take a lot of consideration when, when folks have actually done the first few steps. And then they say, okay, now I've validated the problem. I've built something. I've got some people using it. I understand the mechanisms, the business model behind what it is. And I need some fuel for this to grow it. That's when the, the conversation is interesting. When people say, I have this idea. I'm like, great, go do something with it. <laughs> so, you know, that's for us. It's like, we don't invest in ideas. We invest in companies that have already taken the first few steps and built something and better have people using that something and even better have people paying for them, paying to use that something. Um, but the ways to get to us, we've tried to lower, very much lower to make it so that you don't have to have a warm intro. You don't have to know me. You don't have to like, you know, run into me in Atlanta. You can just literally go on our website and apply. And that's how we will start all conversations. Even if you meet me, I'm going to say, go on our website and apply because we want people to have, we want to have the same information about all the companies that we potentially will invest in. So collab.capital is the website. And um, our team has done a really nice job of putting all the information you could possibly need as far as what we're looking for, what we invest in and all of that on the website. So you can take a read and um, and know before you waste your time filling out the application if if you might be a good fit. All right. The, um, when is the next Google cohort going to open up? So we do there's a few things that we do. So we have Founders Academy. Uh, we're actually midway through Founders Academy, so the next one won't be until top of next year, probably. Um, but we do have the Google for Startups Accelerators, which Jason runs. Um, and we're actually going to be coming out with announcements on those applications. I don't know when this is airing, but they're going to be coming out pretty soon um, in June. And then what else? Yeah, I think those are kind of the main programs that we run. But Follow Google for startups and you'll see all the posts about um, when things are are launching. While you were raising, do you have any funny stories? There's lots of bad stories like, oh, the investor said this. Or, oh, they didn't understand. Or they blah, 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 blah. Do you have any funny stories <laughs> about, it, about why you were raising, uh, about thoughts you had or feelings you had or, as, or you as Justin and Barry, your team had? Um, or like actual like encounters that you literally left the meeting and laughed or you had to laugh in the middle of the meeting? Um, I mean, it's always, I won't say funny because I do have some level of empathy for this, but because our fund is focused on Black founders, we had so many meetings where people really struggled with how they wanted to talk about that. Um, because people, you know, mm -hmm. some people struggle with like saying Black. That to them is... They do. They do. It's like risky or something. And so it, it was funny, you know, watching people sort of do gymnastics around what we what we're saying very clearly is that we're investing in black founders and they want to put new words around it. And, you know, so that's something we would laugh about. And then honestly, this isn't again, this is not a funny thing. It was just like an interesting thing to witness was post George Floyd, how many people would like cry in, in meetings where, you know, they just got emotional about what we're doing and how they feel about it and, you know, guilt that might be wrapped up in that. And so that was always interesting to kind of try to, of course, show empathy, empathy and like care for them in the situation, but also like also want to steer the meeting to what we had to say <laughs> at the same time. So, <laughs> um, right. Because they're listening. Some of the calls we've been on, people are just talking, 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 you know, and growing up in my, and I'm like, sir, 
I need this money. Yeah. Okay. Like, what are we doing? Like, I'm- yeah. Yeah. There, I mean, I can think of several instances where like, they told me all about all the black people that they've ever known and <laughs> just all these things. I'm like, mm. I feel you, but that's really not relevant to the conversation. So, um, it's, it's interesting what, I mean, I'm kind of joking, but I'm like very from a people watching and like psychology perspective, very interested in what's people, what's going on in people's minds around the moment that we're in right now and like how they're feeling about things and what's, how that's motivating them or changing their actions related to allocating money, you know, where they're putting their time and attention. It's just really interesting to watch. And we had so many meetings that where this was like the the driving force behind the meeting. And so, um, yeah, that's been something that's totally different than what I experienced when I was raising for Perfect because people were not, they did not care at all about (laughs) these things. Or maybe they did care, but definitely didn't show up in the meetings. So um, it's, it's just interesting. Yeah, no, same. And even in like the philanthropic world, a lot of fundraising was traditionally um, dominated by like white women. And in, it turned into a place where like the people didn't want to talk to white women. They wanted to talk to me or they wanted to talk to Christine and my board chair. They want to talk to us directly. Yeah. Um, it's a little bit overwhelming at some point, at some points. Also, I, I had a lot of empathy for it. Like, wow, like, like, I've been living this truth for a long time, but, like, you are just living this yeah. truth. Like, you're really experiencing something right now, right? And, like, I'm just kind of staring at the screen, like, <laughs> like <I'm, laughs> the first couple times I'm in awe because I'm like, where you been? Yeah. Like, did you not know? Like, what, what news haven't you been watching, right? But I think this just hit different. This time it hit different. It did. And I think, you know, COVID had a lot to do with it too, because people really had nowhere to go. You know, they didn't have anywhere to divert their attention to. It's like, no, you're going to see this. You're going to watch it. You're going to experience it. And I had the same experience because I'm thinking, man, this is not new. Like, this is really not new. But people just saw it in a different way. So unfortunate, but also I'm glad that, you know, it, it woke some people up. Yeah, I think, you know, talking about the pandemic and talking about the tragedy of George Floyd's murder um, is challenging because there's, like, bad, like, bad in George George Floyd's murder is a tragedy, right? And then there's, like, so much good. Like, they're, like, literally nobody can say that they can't meet virtually right now, and I'm so happy about it. Yes. Because I never want to go into D.C. if I don't have to get a parking ticket. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like being able to learn at a distance has its ups and downs, right? But I wonder where we're going to come out of this seeing, like, what that meant from an educational standpoint for people to have asynchronous days. Like, what? I wish I had an asynchronous day when I was in school. Like, it's one thing to have to be on the screen all day, but did y'all realize that y'all got like a health day? You got like a mental health wellness day in your week. Like we never get yeah. that when we're in person or give our children that, right? Like I used to give my children that, but like, you know, it's just like some of these things, maybe we should have been more careful about how we carry food around or like how close we sit or how long we're sitting or like, we probably should have been thinking about this a long time ago. Yes, definitely. It's crazy. Yeah, there's definitely some good, yeah. good outcomes that we should keep, for sure, uh, coming out of the pandemic. Well, I want to honor your time, and I really appreciate you spending this time with me. Is there anything that you would like to leave the audience in general that you feel like we didn't say or we didn't cover or... You just want to make sure people know. Like, you need just know this thing. If you don't know anything else, I said know this. Uh, <laughs> if there's anything like that, um, I, I would say, kind of touching on what you just hit on about the the wellness days for your kids. Um, for founders, I think it's so important to care for your your mental health, um, your physical health as well, but really your mental health because it could be such a lonely journey. And I talk about this all the time, but when I was building my company, 
I did not do a good job caring for my mental health. And I really crashed um, when I sold the business and really fell into a deep depression. And so I, I think now I hope that people have more tools to balance their journeys and spend the time to make sure that they're taking care of themselves. I think you're a better leader. You can better lead your team um, when you're not pouring from an empty cup. So that is the last thing that I will leave your audience with. Oh, that's such a big one, especially with like what's going on with Naomi Osaka right now. Yes. And um, I think she has so much power um, in, in really standing up for herself and saying, "I y'all got it. I need some, some time. So I, I really respect what she what she's done. Oh my gosh, the level of of being able to just let that out, right? Because it's like you're thinking it, but like for it to come up from your stomach through your <laughs> like out of your mouth, huge, yeah. right? So like, yeah. What are what do you realize it on the path to it, or do you not realize it until you feel like you've held your breath to the end of the road? Well, for me, I didn't realizing until it was too late. And that's why I'm always like, anytime somebody asks me at the inter- end of an interview, what what's the thing that you didn't say? I always want to mention that because it's hard to recognize it when you're in it. And if you're a goal-driven person and you're just driving to get something done, um, it's hard to remember that you need to like, you know, meditate or pray if that's what you do or eat or sleep. Like it's hard to do all those things in the order that you're supposed to. And and honestly, you know, oftentimes it's not until it's too late that you really recognize like, oh, I'm not, something's off. So the more, I think there's more conversation about it now. And hopefully that helps people to recognize like, oh, I'm not feeling quite right. Or I need to take some time or even, I'm not even thinking straight. Like I haven't even taken the time to literally think. Um, so I'm, I hope that people are taking better care now that it's a little bit more of a common conversation. Yeah, thank you so much for that. I think it's, again, going back to, you know, keeping it real with yourself, like keeping it real with yourself about where you are as a, as a founder and in business, keeping it real with yourself about where you are personally. Yeah. Um, yeah, how you feel mentally. So, well, Jewel Burks, thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate it. Um, we, this is everything for me because I just, I love what you're doing and I appreciate all the, like the path of like constantly manifesting and seeing that come to light. And, you know, people like you exist are for generations to come. So, um, I have a little bit of a surprise for you. Okay. Uh-oh. <laughs> Wait, do you like surprises? Or no? Sure. No, 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 Let's no. see what it is. <laughs> well, as a part of our Nike engagement, we are doing three murals across three cities. And I want to, I have, they, I have the freedom to decide what I want. And I want to appreciate and lament um, black women of today who are like doing this work and like who are I like I love Madam CJ Walker and I appreciate it right and and we stand on her shoulders it, that can't be the only person we talk about forever right like when the history books come out in 2045 there got to be a Jewel Burks in there. There got to be a Shelly Bell in there. There got to be a, you know, a Catherine Finney. A, you know, like there got to be the people who are pushing for equity and economic advancement in a black community um, as a part of going down in these next set of history books. And I'm here for it. So whoever I got to call textbook creators and make it happen, we're going to make it happen. But as a part of these murals, you're one of the people that I want to highlight. Aww. So we are right now in the process of locking in the cities. Um, it won't be in Atlanta, though. Aww. How about that? We'll have to find a funder to make to put it in Atlanta. I know. Right now we have Miami, Chicago, and uh, we need one more city. We're looking at Philly. 
But well, maybe we should maybe, look at Atlanta. I think then. we should look at Atlanta. That would be good. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll have to switch base on that because I don't know any real estate folks in Atlanta. So I had to figure out the we had to figure out the commercial property. I do, owners. and I I just bought a building, so maybe we could put it on on the wall. Ah, look at that! You want to get your yes. mural, your building, girl? You got it. <laughs> Yes. Okay, look, so we're going to circle back <laughs> after this on that. But I did want to let you know that I want you to be one of the people that we do the mural. Um, that is with. so special. Um, Thank you. Yes, I think what you're doing is amazing. And everybody not only deserves to know about it by reading about it in articles that maybe not all of Gen Z would ever look at, but to like see it in a way that they actually adapt. Um, and they say, oh, like, who is this person? Or like, oh, this person is somebody I need to know. Like, in order to get out to the generations to come, we got to use different mediums. Um, so I want to make sure that that we help. That is so amazing. I'm I'm about to go cry after this. I appreciate that. <laughs> That's awesome. Yes. Well, I'm so like, keep up the good work. Keep. I know that it's it's good work. It can be hard work. It can be rewarding work. But it's all worth it. So we really appreciate you at Black Girl Ventures. I really appreciate you individually at Shirley Bell. Um, Thank so yeah, you, Shirley. I appreciate going. you, too. I love your work. I love everything that you're doing. And it's been an honor to spend some time with you. And at some point, I'm sure we will see each other in person again. Thanks for joining us, Disruptors. And congratulations. You have taken another step toward being friggin' amazing. Make sure you visit us at adoseofdisruption.com where you can subscribe to the show in iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, or via RSS feed. Rate and subscribe if you're all the way live. Rate and subscribe if you're all the way live. That's right. Tell a friend, rate and subscribe to keep us all the way live. Come back next week so we can disrupt some more shit.